俺は父さんが若い頃流行った人生を体験できるゲームだ This is the second time I've played Dragon Quest V. The first time I was a monster, 13 years old. Anyone that age with a breath and a pulse harbors the devil. I liked the game then. I love it now. As you, the individual listening, the one holding the controller grows up. As you mature, Dragon Quest V is the game that blossoms as you do. It's something that becomes better as you become better. Dragon Quest has been a part of my life for, well, all of it. My mother's hand-me-down Nintendo was my first game system. I may as well been born controller in hand. Dragon Warrior 1 growing up was known to me as that boring game that you had to read. Mike Tyson lets you jab people. Zelda 2 was a state-of-the-art swordplay emulator. Tetris was as stimulating as it was clean, and Mario 3 was the game that made me wish that I wasn't an only child. Like a dog without a home, Dragon Warrior didn't stand a chance. Eventually I'd discover Breath of Fire, then Chrono Trigger, then the internet, in that order. It turned out that Dragon Warrior was in actuality named Dragon Quest, and they made a lot of sequels. One of which, the fourth sequel in the fifth game, was supposedly just as good as Chrono Trigger. It wasn't. I liked the game, enough to play the other sequels, but Chrono Trigger remained undefeated, untied, and uncompromised. I couldn't have, wouldn't have, considered admitting until today. I've reached that point. Dragon Quest V is as good as Chrono Trigger. There's a reason it's the entry chosen to represent the series in that recent movie. And no, it's not because everybody is actually living in the Matrix. Maybe a sentence too late, but I digress. If there's anything you wish to remain unsoiled, then you know the drill. Spoilers launch in 3, 2, Everyone loves your dad. It hints at what you'll eventually become. Clearly you won't spend forever shadowing him, because a game where you spend the entire time sidekicking, quote unquote helping someone who doesn't need it, isn't fun. Imagine if it was you spent the entire game handing him wrenches or holding a flashlight while he fixes the wagon or something. He's the type of guy that if he asks if you've checked the drawers, you double-check those damn drawers, even though you already know that you did. You will eventually grow up to be a strong, brave man, though never will you be as powerful, as physically imposing as your dad. You will never rip the door off its hinges. Instead, your strength develops into a more sneaky power. Whereas your dad fights effectively alone, you gain many allies, including traditional bad guys, Instead of pulling a door off its cage, you achieve the same effect, firstly by using your social network, and later with a magic key. Before all of this, as a child you'll go on a few smaller adventures by yourself. Your player agency begins in a way Pokemon would later rip off wholesale, with you wandering off the cozy confines of a safe zone into the wilds of the great unknown. Your dad comes to rescue you. Although you were only face to face with a slime tab and probably would have been fine. Dragon Quest V is a game about victory laps. Whenever you do something, adhering to the universal law of JRPGs, news travels faster than you do. The script makes a point to observe and acknowledge your progress. There's an early scenario that serves as a prime example. You'll see some local punky kids terrorizing a frightened cat. After embarking on some standard adventuring fare... Oh no. They put an identical clone of the cat I'm supposed to be saving in the random enemy pool. 
Oh, double no. I just killed the cat I'm trying to save. <laughs> After your mini-adventure, the news, naturally, traveled faster than you did. And after returning, you're greeted to the swoons and tunes of your newfound prestige. You're free to talk to the townspeople, who before treated you with no high regard, now perpetrate the game's first of many victory laps. The segment connects your new pet cat with this idea, and they'll play with your expectations later when you're reunited as an adult. Getting married is a victory lap. Even as a child, the marriage talk is laid in thick. Slavery whips you and Henry into shape, into big strong men that women fawn over. They'll just say yes. You literally choose who to marry by walking up to one or the other the day of your wedding. It's like there's a wedding that's going to happen, and by god it will, so you three just get into this room and figure things out. Overall, it's a very old world approach. This guy is just auctioning his daughter off as a prize to be won to his test of strength. Bianca is the choice the game obviously wants you to make. She's even on the cartridge. Naturally, as a result, I picked Flora. Your kids look better with blue hair anyway. My guilt wouldn't allow me to use Bianca during the quest for your own engagement ring. Fighting along someone whose heart I was about to break was too much to bear. That, or I didn't want to waste experience points on someone I WOULDN'T spend the rest of the game with. Whichever side you land on, you will always select the correct bride. Also in storyline, it's her genes that mattered, not yours. The hero being born as the hero is because she's a descendant of the legendary line. It doesn't really have anything to do with you. Yet at the same time, it doesn't matter who you pick. The one you do ends up being the mom who matters, meaning that the other choice was wrong by default. If I didn't marry Flora, she'd marry this guy and would still give birth to the hero in the universe in the context of my save file. But because this is a video game and not a movie, the correct bride becomes whoever you choose. It's an effective illusion of choice moment. In terms of gameplay, there isn't a whole lot hinging on this decision, just one party member in the color of two more's hair. But to contrast, when shown from an in-universe perspective, it becomes the most cosmic event in human history. Sure, the hero might have been born with this guy as the father, but what are the odds that he'd end up as heroic? Without a strong dad, would he be able to navigate his adventure through to the end? Because Dragon Quest is generous, your marriage is allowed to become a victory lap. Not just because you chose correctly, also not because getting married is a life victory in and of itself, not because you acquire a new party member, your marriage is a victory lap in the most genius way because it coincides with you acquiring the boat. In the history of the Japanese role-playing game, acquiring the boat represents a point in which your adventure truly begins. It's the point where you're guaranteed unprecedented access to the world map. The point in which you feel as free as a real hero. Dragon Quest V builds up to this moment. You start the game on a boat at the bottom of the totem pole. You're just a little kid. You don't yet have the freedom to even fight a slime, let alone control where the boat goes. There are multiple dungeons where you ride a smaller, more localized boat. One day, you might say to yourself, it will all be ours. When tasked with retrieving your engagement ring, you're piloting a boat on loan. It's no coincidence that acquiring a boat to call your own coincides with your honeymoon. It's the ultimate victory lap, celebrating a moment in the story and as a game. Inside a game obsessed with celebrating the victory lap, it's striking when there isn't one. Early on as a child, you'll be in the magical land of fairies, helping them with their problem of the day. When you return home, there's no fanfare, no promenade to bask in the praise of others. Instead, your dad is looking everywhere for you, so you need to find him before he leaves for an adventure without your company. He shepherds you around, and while traveling, you come to the staircase, talk to this old man, and then your dad accidentally goes back down the stairs? He even makes a little exclamation point. I should explain this part. You don't control your dad in these segments. They're just in-game cutscenes. And inside of one of these in-game cutscenes, your dad accidentally walks down a staircase. He goes up, 
to the left to talk to the old man, and then, meaning to leave the area to the right, he just walks over the staircase and accidentally goes back down. It's something that a player might do, and although I can't really explain why, it's one of my favorite moments. Years later, you'll revisit the same staircase and probably avoid making the same mistake. You grew up smarter, though not smart enough to avoid a similar fate. With your wife held hostage, you are turned to stone and sold as a lawn ornament. The children you father are collectively better than you. As you grow up smarter than your father, your children collectively grow up smarter than you. For example, your revive spell only works 50% of the time, and your son's is a guaranteed success. When your dad dies, he's gone forever. You can't bring him back. Just like yourself. Again, your children succeed where you have failed. They've done the impossible and successfully bring you back to life. When you were a child, your dad is tasked with becoming the bodyguard to a stereotypically spoiled prince. It inevitably doesn't go well. He gets kidnapped and your dad leaves to rescue him. Up to this point, he's taken you with him on all the adventures in the game, though this time, he leaves you behind. But of course you follow him. He succeeds in rescuing the prince by ripping the cell door off its hinges, but your triumph will be short-lived. Because you followed him, the monsters are able to take you hostage, and your dad, helpless to do anything, trades his life for yours. The stinger is that the situation could have been avoided if you just let him do his thing. Your dad, the coolest person in the world, a man capable of splitting a metal door from its pins, is dead. And it's your fault. Adhering to the first rule of great fiction, it's about the how, not the what. I can spoil what happens in a cheeky way like I did in this video, in that transition text. But it doesn't take away from the moment. It's not shocking that your dad dies. It's the commitment that building him up that makes the sudden crash so effective. The fact that, coincidentally, in a moment of dramatic irony, you're the one who dooms him, is the kind of thing that memorable plots are built around. Right, I was gonna do like a jump kick. Alright. This might be a little weird, and I'm gonna bet that it sounds horrible, but, you know, I'm using what I got, and I just want to say that death being used as really just a trope for the big emotional moment in many forms of fiction is so prevalent just because it happens to everyone. Everyone you know, all your loved people, they're all going to die, not just you, and you're going to go through a few in your day, so... Alright, here's this story. So my dad is dead, and unfortunately sometimes it just happens. Like one day he's there and the next day he's not. But there are deaths that you know are long and drawn out. I've had one of those in my family too with brain cancer. There was like a slow descent over the course of really about two years. And it wasn't the case here. It was, let's rewind a couple months. So my dad was in like a really bad relationship where you could just tell that nobody was really happy and like he got kicked out of his house and I had a small apartment that was really just like a bedroom and an open area but he, he slept on my couch for about a month during that. And God bless him because I live pretty far away. He commuted like two and a half hours to work every day. I don't know man. It's like you're hanging out with him for a month. Sorry to hear that plane. And then, like, he goes back to his life, and I go back to mine, and on his birthday, I just, I send him a text, and it just says, happy birthday, dad, and all he sent back was, thanks, all lowercase, with a period, and that was the last time I ever talked to him, because like, a couple weeks later, it was, that was, he was gone, that was it. I got a call and they found him. This didn't like just happen. Like this happened. Within the lifespan of this channel, I didn't really feel the need to talk about it then, but for whatever reason I do now. I guess what I'm trying to say, or all I'm really trying to say is, call your relatives. I always call mine now. 
and you know just embrace what you have while you have it because it can just go away like that and I'm sorry if this was weird I'm sorry if this made half the people turn off the video I know for a fact it's gonna sound like garbage and I'm not even sure if I'm gonna include it Final Fantasy IV had the right idea. They used game mechanics to reinforce the plot. It's a shame that it ultimately doesn't end up mattering because it doesn't have one with much worth. As a genre, there are a lot of mechanics that made the Japanese-style RPG better at telling stories than many of its gaming contemporaries. Most of the time, if you're a game from the late 80s and early 90s, they were just essentially prolonged third acts with the first two being confined to the instruction manual. That is, if they existed at all. The early RPGs were really the first attempt to tell complete stories from beginning to end. In Donkey Kong, the rising actions would have been Mario or Jumpman having a pet gorilla, and possibly being cruel to him. The climax being the moment where he breaks free and takes the girl to the top of the construction site, and the third act being the game itself. When you look at, for example, the first Final Fantasy, your characters just sort of spawn into existence at the start, and all the events, the beginning, middle, and end, happen within the confines of the game itself. I say this, and sure, there's stuff that happens before the game, but don't confuse lore with the first two acts of a plot. Dragon Quest V is the lessons learned from the collective up until that point. It was the best JRPG when it came out, not because it was the biggest. At this time, we were past the point where that could carry a sequel by itself. No. Dragon Quest V is better than, for example, Final Fantasy IV, because the people who made this game might have just started to write a plot outline before writing the game script. It has moments of foreshadowing that would have made the creator of Final Fantasy, Sakaguchi, cry, such as this person both referencing Dragon Quest IV and alluding to the last obstacle you'll come across. Heck, this game has a moment where you meet your older self in the opening hours. Something that won't come full circle until the end game. A small but poignant difference I have noticed between Dragon Quest and Final Fantasy is that when you die, in the latter you're always sent back to the title screen and forced to reload a save file. Upon your return to the game, it would be like nothing ever happened to your avatar. On the other hand, Dragon Quest allows your player avatar to fail albeit at a cost of half your gold. But in universe, your player could have died to some slimes over and over again, but through some force being generated by half the money, you can not only revive, but convince the population of the world that nothing of note happened. Someone once told me that they did not like the Dragon Quest series because it's too generic. Buddy, the word you're looking for is universal. Our plot here works in part because it's built on a familiar fantasy-based world in an unreliable time in history with magic but lacking the modern technology. It works because it's straightforward. Unlike, again, Final Fantasy IV, it isn't obsessed with ending every scene with a climax. There aren't pointless melodramatic cutscenes after every scenario. There's no moment where Yang blows himself up to destroy a supercomputer, and you just end up leaving the scene more puzzled than depressed about what he did. In stark contrast, a dramatic moment in Dragon Quest, as an adult you come across this man in a bar desperate for help and saving his modest, destitute village that's being terrorized by a monster. You agree to help, and it turns out that the monster was just your cat friend from when you were a child. After reuniting, the townspeople assume that you manufactured the entire thing to extort them. It's a misunderstanding, and through no fault of your own, you're villainized. Instead of the usual victory lap, it's a disappointing appointment. It manages to get the same gut feeling that you might feel when a character dies in a completely different way that, frankly, like no other game, I don't think did ever up until that point. Maybe the part in Dragon Quest 3 where you have to leave your party member behind in that town, and then you come back later and he's in jail? But I don't know, I guess I would have to replay Dragon Quest 3. Dragon Quest V's protagonist is the most interesting man in the world. It might sound silly to point this out, but a lot of games don't attempt to do this. Using Final Fantasy IV as a reference one last time, Cecil's storyline is concluded about four hours in and the most interesting stuff is tied into the ancillary characters. Sure, it's supposed to be his story, but most of the stuff that happens after those first few hours just doesn't really involve him. 
Starting with 3, the Dragon Quest series has always been able to deliver compelling short-term problem-of-the-day type vignettes. They use these to string together a completed work. But 5 is an outlier, even when viewed in the context of the later games, because it doesn't quite follow this structure. 5 is the story of some guy's life. Dragon Quest V is proof that video games had grown up from the short bursts of arcade-like origins. You can only play Pac-Man for so long until you're not a kid anymore and you've outgrown it. If games stayed the same way, it's easy to imagine that basically everyone would have given up on video games forever. It would have been relegated to the bottom of the toy box. There was a time when it was assumed that everyone would just eventually grow out of video games in the same way that a child would grow out of taking naps or being bored at Home Depot or swinging on a swing set. Something happened though. Video games themselves grew up. Final Fantasy IV and Fantasy Star III were earnest attempts, but they don't deliver the goods in the same way that this game does. Dragon Quest IV managed to get the characters right, but the plot developments are never more nuanced than you need to stop the evil guy. Now, the game went to great lengths to build up a sympathetic villain. They gave him a backstory and a damn good one to boot, but as to what happens within the text, the actions your party takes, there wasn't anything that we hadn't seen before. 5 takes a lot of stuff from 4 and runs with it. For example, the auto battle is here, except this time you can opt out of it. Personally, I love auto battle. Most fights you're supposed to use it, and that's why it's there. For a series with a reputation of making the same game over and over, the games aren't afraid of introducing a major game mechanic and then completely abandoning it with the sequels. Case in point, the monster recruiting system. The phenomenon I just outlined is well documented, but a point that I find more interesting, and one that gets brought up less often, is how the games hold back something so core to their identity for a large chunk of the opening. You don't have access to the monster recruiting in this game until you're an adult. And even then, it's gated behind an optional, missable shop that's only open at night. Dragon Quest VII is the most infamous entry in that regard. Someday, who knows, maybe I'll look at that one because I think I'd have a lot to say. But that's a game where your first tutorial fight doesn't happen for around three hours. And the expected job system that's core to the battle mechanics doesn't happen until around 25. Heck, you can argue that the game truly doesn't begin in earnest until well after the 60 hour mark. And no, I'm not exaggerating. The monster system that is within Dragon Quest V exists, but the game doesn't call much attention to itself. Other games like Pokemon or the next game in this YouTube series, subscribe, cough, cough, leave a comment, cough, 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 Shin Megami Tensei shape their entire game around this concept, something that's already just within, shaped and beautiful inside this game. Or, as it was more eloquently put, Almost every Japanese video game currently being celebrated by hardcore game-likers here in the late 2010s learned every one of its good habits from Dragon Quest. Pokemon's monster collection is from Dragon Quest V. The sublime gambling arithmetic of Shin Megami Tensei and Persona's battle systems owes a lot to Dragon Quest III. <laughs> So Dragon Quest V has this place called Okelberry, and it's the stereotypical casino gambling thief trap town trope that you see in a lot of JRPGs. So I was playing the games and it didn't seem possible to me, at a glance, to win unless you really save state your way through it, as in you save and then if you lose you reload until you win every time. The difference between casinos in real life and casinos in video games are that they're tilted ever so slightly to be in your favor in most games. Like, think of the Pokemon slot machines. The slot machines in Pokemon are designed in a way that the longer you keep playing, the more tokens, the more currency you win. As opposed to a casino in real life where they wouldn't make any money if it were set up that way. So they're always geared to take more money than you give them. 
That's how they stay in business. That's how they work. I was in the casino in this game and I couldn't shake the thought that it's amazingly brutal for a video game casino. So what I did was after I beat the game, I went back to the casino and I did some small quasi-scientific tests to see if it is even possible to actually viably consistently make your coin total go up by playing the casino. I spent eight hours in this casino testing out different methods, eight different methods to be exact, for one hour each to see if I would get coins and if there was a way to just make money in this casino because it didn't seem possible while I was playing the game. Eight hours might not seem like a lot of time, but think about how long that is. That's an entire work day. That's the entire length of a lot of, you know, modern indie games would end in a lot shorter than that. Heck, it's longer than I played Draken or Yeez 3 for this series. So the first thing I did was I tested out the slot machines. Dragon Quest V has three different types of slot machines. You have the one coin slots, 10 coin, and the 100 coins. So I started with 100 coins, and I played the one hour coin slot for exactly one hour, which resulted in me getting 246 coins. So, which is an average of 4.1 coins per minute. So, yes, I was getting coins doing that, but would hope that I'm averaging more than four coins a minute. That's, that's pathetic, frankly, when you see how much money some of the stuff costs. So then I played the 10 coin slots, and I started with a thousand, and this time I ended with 3,040. Which works out to an average of 50 and two-thirds coins per minute. Now we're getting somewhere. That's still not a lot, if I'm being honest. Because no, we can do better. So finally moving on to the 100 coin slot, I started with, keeping in line, 10,000. And I ended, I ended up with 83,900 coins after an hour. Which works out to almost 1,400 coins per minute, which blew me away that you can actually make money on the slots in this, because it didn't seem like at all before I dove into the numbers that I was actually gaining money. Because the way that it works is most of the time you lose money, but you do hit on the jackpots, the really big payouts. The really big payouts happen just enough that you will be in the black. You, you will make money playing the slot machine eventually. If you're serious about making coins in this game, allow me to spoil the other experiments. This is the best one. Play the 100 coin slot, mash up for all eternity, and that's the way to make money in the casino. But still, there's two more games you can play. You can bet on slime races or you can bet on monster fights. Now, slime racing is kind of a shit show. So, for my first experiment, I bet all the slimes that had the best odds of winning with the lowest payouts, and the first thing about slime racing that makes it way more inefficient, even if you ended up winning, is how long it takes to bet. Now, I'm gonna play one complete bet in real time, and it's gonna be the most boring part of this video, because it's just... well, just, you'll see.
So after an hour of this strategy of betting the slimes with the best odds to win with the lowest payout, I started with 83,900 and I ended up with 82,415. So I actually lost money betting on the slimes. So for the next time, I only bet the ones that were in the middle. Not the slimes that had the best odds to win, but the ones that were kind of in the middle. Not the super long shots. The ones in the teens, the ones with the high single digit odds. And this was an even bigger disaster. I started with what I had left over last time, which was 82,415. And I ended up with 80,633. So we're down about 1,800. Which didn't give me a lot of hope for betting the long shots, but... To my surprise, after an hour of only betting the long shots, I actually won money. I started with 80,633 and ended up with 81,821. Which was incredible to me that if you're gonna bet the slime races, you're better off betting... You're better off betting the slimes that have payouts of times 20 or above. Which stunned the hell out of me. So the last thing you can do in the casino is bet on the monster fights. So I did that for an hour betting the ones with the best odds to win, and I started with 81,821, which is what I ended up with last time, and I ended with 81,786. So after an hour, I was down about 40. But the interesting thing about this is that you can do double or nothing after you win, or actually I shouldn't say double or nothing. You can do... So if normally the maximum bet is 50 coins, you can then take the money that you won from the first bet and cycle that back in to the next fight, which lets you bet way more than the standard 50. So after an hour of doing this one time per fight, I would bet on the monster with the best odds both fights. I ended up with 82,035, starting with 81,786. So I did make some coins, but it was almost nothing. It was not worth it. So the lesson is, casino, not complete bullshit, because the slot machines are just good enough to make it worth it. But just barely. Are you sick of that stupid music yet? Yes, the whole point of this part of the video is to show you how fucking annoying the casino music is. You're expected to spend so much time here playing the damn slot machine to grind up for the King Metal Sword, and... The music, just the instruments sound awful. Just horrible. I normally don't comment on the music just because my opinions are never more nuanced than I like this or I don't like this, but holy shit, I really don't like this song. And it's not like it's the composition because in the remakes, for example, on the PS2 or on the DS, the song sounds fine. It's just here. Just wow. It's bad. It's been said that these games are like fairy tales. Every Dragon Quest game has the sage-like quality of something your grandpa told you when you were young. There's an unnatural, unexplained undercurrent. Most of it happens when you're a kid, and I don't think that's a coincidence. You have the ghost castle, the fairy village. It's almost as if the only way you could be useful as an adventurer so early on in life is when you're dealing with things outside the real world, or if you're attached to your dad's hip. Only children can see the fairies. You're the only kid in town, meaning you're the only one who can save the fairies. You're the chosen one here, but you're not THE chosen one. This detail comes full circle when you need to go back to the fairy dimension. Your kids are the only ones that are capable of finding it now. Assuming this old man couldn't have come here post-adolescence, he and his friend have been here a long time. He was still elderly 20 years ago when you were here the first time. The fairy town is the type of place where you can just hold up from the entrance and end up face to face with the monarch. Dragon Quest is full of NPCs that are a half to a complete whole. Someone might say something in one part, which doesn't hold meaning until you remember something that someone else said. For example, this NPC hints that your wife was a former nun, or this lady lamenting that her husband used to abuse her is the same one from your hometown. There they had a slightly amusing back and forth, but here it's turned on its head. Both sides of the puzzle in this instance are the same person. There's a man who's nervously talking to some innkeepers, 
And if you return at night, you learn that he's on his honeymoon and his wife won't even let him sleep. Not with her. Not in the same bed. She won't even let him sleep in the other bed in the same room. He's sleeping on the floor and there's two beds in the room. The remake actually lets you marry this woman. And if I ever play that version, I will. I will become this guy. There's a dark streak if you know where to look. Some people are just evil, like the people who go around kidnapping kids. They don't appear to have any real loyalty to the Demon Lord. Their hearts are just ice cold. And you never have the opportunity to properly extract your revenge. There are times when I am harshly reminded this isn't an official translation. There are some dialogue inconsistencies, and there's a guy you fight named the Dragon Warrior. I'd like to imagine the same people who localized the NES games wouldn't have named this enemy the same thing as the title of the game. It's a little too on the nose. As an aside, the people who did the Dragon Warrior games on NES deserve a medal. Easily the best translation job by a mile for that era. This game doles out the world map significantly slower than most. As a kid, you spend most of your time locked into the general vicinity of wherever your dad happened to be. And when you break out of slavery, the first places you visit are mostly the places you've already been. This bunny girl has aged remarkably well. She looks exactly the same no matter what era you visit this town in. Once you get married and obtain the boat, the game keeps opening up. You'll get a magic carpet and a floating castle. Every time you gain access to a new method of travel, the world map opens up like a puzzle box. There's a part where as a kid you learn about a secret passage leaving the castle. It's over here on the right side, and later on you need to sneak back into the same castle. Only, this isn't the secret passage you're supposed to use. I guess this being a secret wouldn't make sense in a real world environment, because it would be in 3D and you could just see the door on the side. So instead, you need to sail under the bridge. A lot of this game's dialogue is content with not ever being seen. For example, if you return to that poor town towards the end, they will have realized their mistake and forgiven you. This game has some dungeon gimmicks, and if you've ever watched any of my videos, you might know that I love a good gimmick. Here's one that I like. There's a dark room that you need to stumble your way through, and it's not as simple as turn left once. It will actually probably take you a minute to work out. Then, after, in the next room in fact, you're given a torch. Now torches have been around since the first Dragon Quest, but they're just items that you were expected to buy and then maybe remember to use if you happen to start exploring a cave. Here, they give you the torch by teaching you its usefulness by putting you in a situation where you could have already used one. There's a gross and weird minecart dungeon where you need to flip switches so the carts will go in the correct direction. Imagine this, you're playing a JRPG, you're about to leave a room and you see an unopened chest. Do you go back and get the chest? Normally, admittedly, I'm someone who would not, but in this instance I was feeling particularly rambunctious, so I went for it. I ran into seven random battles on the way to this chest, and four more on the way back. Just for a little bit of gold. Hey, it's not always worth it. A lot of JRPGs have some form of the sliding block puzzle, but what you don't always see are sliding room puzzles. It's like one of those panel puzzles, only you're playing it with rooms in a dungeon. The NPC shuffle is real. I thought this slime was deliberately blocking me, and I had to find an item or another way to talk to the dwarf over there. But, no, I was just unlucky. Also, trying to talk to the NPCs in jail is as maddening as waiting for the toaster to pop. Gotta love missing the guy you're trying to talk to. You ever play Shining Force 2? They did one of the most revolutionary things in the entire genre. If you miss talking to one of the NPCs, through some black magic, the game knows who you were trying to talk to, and it just works anyway. There's nothing like the feeling of picking up the legendary sword of your dead dad, 
only for the game to tell you that your hands are full. And you need to spend some bone-crunching seconds deciding what to throw out, just so you can pick it up. Hooray! You made it, viewer. You made it, future me who's editing this video. But first, I do need to address the ending of this game. The end of Dragon Quest V doesn't have you killing your personal arch-nemesis, the guy who killed your father. You take care of him in a cave, mostly uneventfully, but it makes sense because at that point in the game, it's not your story, it's your son's. After killing the boss, the reward, a playable ending. Now these are great because they're the culmination of the game's NPC storytelling arc, but after the ending, after the credits, even after seeing the, the end screen, the job is never done. The references to the final boss from Dragon Quest IV, they aren't just an homage. He's real. And he's evil. This is the ultimate boss. And in the end, I was only able to win by using the protagonist's special ability. He can sacrifice himself to revive and heal the rest of the party. It was a necessary thing because I was down to just him and... There was only one thing I could do. Much like real life. You lived. You died. So your kids can live better. This has been Jason Graves. Remember to never trust anyone who needs a haircut. And I thank you for watching. Good night.